Well, thank you very much indeed, Minister. Um, just before we kick off the question and answers session, uh, just to say that this session is taking place on the record. Um, and and regards questions, if you could just identify yourself, say who you are, and your institutional affiliation. So we've got about uh, 35 minutes or so, uh, but a little bit more than that. And would anybody like to ask the first question? Yes. Honour Daly, Honour Daly, member of the Institute. Thank you for visiting us. My question is about Bulgaria's relationship with Russia. Last week, Vladimir Putin met with Bundeskanzler Angela Merkel, and it appears that she is trying to put relations between the European Union, in a broader sense, back on track uh, with Russia. Do you have any comment? I know that Bulgaria has very close cultural ties with Russia. How Bulgaria sees the I ideal development of foreign common European policy as regards Russia? Okay. Shall we open? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no, you could say there. If you're, I'll you're I feel comfortable. Okay. Okay. So, um, this question really comes right on time uh, because today exactly our president is in Russia meeting <laughs> President Putin. Yesterday he met uh, Prime Minister Medvedev and today he's there meeting um, the president of uh, Russian Federation. And it is a real topical question, so thank you for this. Uh, there are a lot of speculations very often about our relationship with Russia, but I think we were always a country that followed exactly the common foreign security policy as far as Russia has been concerned. And if um, someone can find even a case where uh, Bulgaria was outside of this policy as government, as uh, official um, official establishment, if, if I may say so, please ask me a question again. But uh, I think, yes, we were absolutely uh, following these uh, five guiding principles of the relationship with Russia, which include, of course, the uh, fulfillment of the so-called Minsk agreements, which is part of the relationship as far as uh, Ukraine is concerned, and the issues that uh, um, concern the security in and around Ukraine. It's always uh, a very important issue. It's important issue to us even more than to others because we are very close. We are neighbors uh, in the Black Sea. We are neighbors with both countries. And also Crimea is in the Black Sea. Everyone knows that. But we are absolutely following the common um, European policy on these issues. And uh, here we have uh, sanctions and these sanctions will stay until we have progress on the Minsk agreement. So there is no exception to this rule for us. Of course, the five guiding principles include also to have a relationship with Russia on uh, many other issues and to keep it also with the civil society. So um, we think it's important to keep all the channels of communications open. And that is why we, we have a um, uh, certain relationship which is not more intensive than of others. I think this visit comes uh, of our president to, to Moscow uh, after a long pause of uh, high-level visits between the two countries. And it's also part of the general, I would say, chill in, in this relationship between the European Union countries and uh, uh, Russia. And um, what we see uh, that is positive and important to keep is that uh, this country will stay. It, it is not going to go anywhere. We have to have uh, really some certain relationship, very pragmatic relationship with, with Russia, which is uh, um, to no detriment to the general policy that we have with Russia, as I mentioned. But. Um, we also have strong uh, cultural ties with this country, between the two peoples, and uh, it is uh, not possible just to interrupt all the, all the relationship. Besides, we have also important energy relations with this country, and um, like many in Eastern Europe, we were having um, a lot of our, um, 
our gas and other energy sources brought by Russia actually to this part of Europe. So we cannot interrupt everything uh, like uh, from uh, uh, just in one moment, from another moment. We, we need to do a lot more to diversify, which is also our policy on energy issues. But still, we, we think it is important to keep a uh, good relationship and to try to um, make them even better whenever it is possible. Of course, not uh, uh, to the expense of breaching sanctions. And here we are also very strict in uh, implementing whatever it takes, because we also suffer a lot as far as our agricultural products are concerned, as far as uh, some products of this um, defense industry are concerned also. Uh, but that is why we very much rely upon the development of this new, as I mentioned, new and very important uh, policy of the European Union in uh, uh, common uh, defense and also developing this new regulation, which is still under question mark, but we are doing our best to bring it to fruition. It is the regulation to um, create a common industrial program financed by the European Union to uh, develop together our industries and connect them even better in the European Union. So this is, speaking about Russia, this is our, our view from this corner of Europe. It is very pro-European, I would have to say. Thank you very much yeah. indeed, Minister. Um, may I just ask you a question about last week's summit mm -hmm. meeting? Um, many people looking at the communique mm -hmm. um, said that it was disappointing compared to the communique coming out of Thessaloniki 15 years ago, and that in some ways it represented a backward step <laughs> for the Western Balkans. And I just want to ask you how you anticipate everything is going to go between now and the European Council in June, and whether the European Council is going to follow up on the Commission's recommendation that Albania, for example, and Macedonia's status will be upgraded, and whether we're going to see momentum. Because I think the worrying thing for many people is uh, not only uh, that Germany is much more reluctant to embrace enlargement than it was 15 years ago, but also President Macron uh, in Sofia. The language that he used uh, for many people suggested that he wasn't particularly enthusiastic about the Western Balkans either. So I just wonder about the impressions that you took away from the summit meeting, and given the enormous effort that Bulgaria has put into injecting momentum into enlargement, are we going to get a positive outcome at the summit meeting in June? And what would that positive outcome look like from your perspective? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It is our a very important question in the recent uh, weeks that we were dealing with, and not only weeks. Um, I started myself to work for the success of this meeting as of first meetings uh, I have done as a political, I was political director of my ministry before being upgraded to this uh, post and um, in February last year in 2017 I actually have made certain meetings in the Commission and in other European institutions starting talking about uh, organizing such a summit meeting in Sofia during our presidency and trying again to uh, not probably again but uh, after so many years to bring back the focus of the attention of European countries and institutions toward this uh, region of the West, so-called Western Balkans. Um, I think uh, at the very beginning it was really very difficult. Nobody wanted to listen. Everyone was saying, no, there are so many and so influential countries in the European Union that are absolutely against, and it's better that you just quit and you mm. don't deal with this issue at all because nobody will want to come to Sofia and um, start talking about these countries. So the skepticism was really, really strong and um, it was really hard to start persuading people that it's really important to, to do something. And besides, there is the enlargement process which uh, has its uh, very well-established channels uh, to develop, so it was easy 
to say there is a there is a, a process so you can leave the things as they are and just quit this issue and find another better subject to, to deal with. Uh, but we, we decided we continue and we think that it is a very important, uh, very important issue, a very important part of our own national uh, foreign policy and the perception for the world, that we think that uh, we can have better security and stability in the whole Europe, in the whole corner of the, the world, uh, there uh, only through European uh, perspective and European path for all these countries that are situated there, because we are really sure and we know that they are just European countries and they should have this perspective open. So we started to work a lot and work on all different levels that were possible with uh, many countries and especially in Brussels, which is, of course, everything is concentrated there. And um, I think at least we managed to have everyone on board. And finally, uh, it, is, it was a great success, the very summit itself that happened in Sofia, because we have seen everyone there on board with one exception. We know why, but I don't want to mention uh, different um, countries, but it was really a very well motivated and there was a good meeting the, the, the evening before, so we know that um, there was a support also for, for general support for enlargement and for even stronger than some other countries that participated. But, but in any case, yes, if you read the text, it, it is not so impressive, it's true, but it is still a text that was adopted by all 28 countries, 28 member mm -hmm. states, and all the six Western Balkans uh, aligned to this text. It wasn't possible that because of the non-recognizers of Kosovo to have them all agree together or sign it in a form. You never sign actually political statements, but mm -hmm. usually don't sign. But uh, in this case, it was really, I think, a success after it's, you, we should not be maximalistic. I mean, we know that diplomacy is not the skill to have a maximum result, but it is also something that is uh, about the possibility that exists. Uh, so what is possible and what is uh, really desirable. And um, I think we, we have managed in these circumstances to reach the maximum. It is um, up to others to decide and to, to judge, but I think it was really a good um, good result that we were having. Also, we have this um, annex to this um, declaration, which is uh, so-called Sofia Positive Agenda for the Western Balkans, and it is about very specific projects, uh, and they concern connectivity mainly, all these different types of connectivity, which is uh, in um, the modern era not only uh, transport, not only energy, but also digital connectivity. In, in many ways, human, human relationship and also connectivity in education and it, in the possibilities to, for all these countries to benefit from the possibilities that exist also in the European Union. And I think it also helps a lot to confirm the European perspective and uh, to see uh, whatever is possible to be done from our side and now it comes their turn to show up what, what is uh, possible from their side to be done also, to persuade all these uh, very skeptical countries, some of them, to, to really open this perspective even, even wider. <laughs> so um, I think it is really a very, very important summit. We cannot compare moments in time. It was 2003 in Thessaloniki, the previous one. And at that time, even Kosovo was not uh, on the map of Europe, and there were also other things that were not existing. For example, Montenegro, which gained independence in 2006. So there were a lot of changes that were um, that we lived through all these years. Uh, but still, th this is the the main message. We very often say that it is also a Balkan presidency. <laughs> because we were supported by other countries from the region like Greece and Romania, and Romania, although a non-recognizer, their president participated in the summit, and it was a gesture towards the Bulgarian presidency. Mm -hmm. He might have refused, actually, sure. <laughs> with the full right. I mean, as a, as a lawyer, our ambassador <laughs> may 
I confirm that they, they are not obliged at all to, to take part in this, uh, but, the, but they came. Mm. And even uh, participated in the um, family photo, <laughs> which was another big issue for some countries. Mm. So I think it was the, the possible and very positive outcome. And I think it was uh, good that we have managed to have it. I think also that the strategy of the European Commission adopted on the 6th of February was also part of this joint effort, which was very well understood by many in Brussels, also in the, in the institutions. People in DG Near, which is dealing with enlargement, know, they know actually very well what is happening on the ground. And I think they were really assessing positively this effort and trying to somehow to respond to this policy and to be uh, really in fine tuning with, uh, with the Bulgarian presidency and what, what were our vision for this. And about the June enlargement uh, uh, conclusions, we are really hopeful that we will be in a position to have this time after 18 months uh, joint conclusions with the participation of everyone else on board. And um, w there might be certain exceptions, but this time we try to do our best and have this type of conclusion that will fulfill the national positions of everyone. We will see. It is not an easy task, I have to admit, but we will do our best. We still have several weeks in front of us. Yeah. Thank you. Further questions? Jill. Uh, on the IIA. And yes, thanks very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, I just wondered, could you elaborate a little bit just on the Dublin regulation? Because I think that's quite of interest uh, to, to my audience um, because um, it is uh, contested. And the second thing I just wanted to ask you was you said then that it was more important to get agreement on the priorities before we start haggling in the MFF negotiations about the budgetary contributions. And I just wonder to what extent is there now convergence or consensus emerging around the priorities of the MFF? Oh, thank you. Thank you for this for these questions. They are very difficult. <laughs> but very interesting, yes. So uh, I, I mentioned in our previous talk uh, the Dublin regulation. It has uh, the name of this beautiful city, of course. <laughs> Uh, although I think there we are together with Ireland on, on this issue. Here we were trying to have a um, balanced approach and have again on board um, both sides in, in the European mm -hmm. Union, which are now uh, more or less in diverging positions about, uh, as I mentioned, uh, solidarity and responsibility. And here we have um, uh, to a certain extent confronting uh, views of countries that are uh, at the border of the European Union and are confronted directly with the first um, wave of uh, migration that comes sometimes illegally and sometimes we have, uh, of course, sometimes refugees. Um, and we have the countries that are uh, the final destination of uh, certain of these uh, people of some of these people, and uh, we have also others who just uh, would like to have a um, national approach and control of their own borders without uh, taking any kind of uh, solidarity um, responsibility here in, uh, in solidarity. And um, we will try to find our best way uh, to fulfill to a certain extent the and find the right balance between these diverging positions. I, I don't think it will be easy, and we might need the help of the institutions uh, in a certain moment uh, in time from here um, up to the end of June. Uh, but still, uh, we think it's possible. It, it depends on the on the wish uh, on the will of the different countries that are involved in this. The main uh, proponents of the two, the two main uh, opinions in the European Union. What I can just, uh, I cannot get into details because we, we don't have time and they are of course a bit uh, inside, insiders in the middle. But I think it is possible to have, to reach a consensus before the end of our presidency. 
and um, it is important of course to take everyone on board as I said because we can understand that also the countries of final destination are uh, having a lot of a burden in, on their economies, their national budget, so it is absolutely understandable to us. From, from, an, from another point of view, here we have also the views of the so-called front, frontline countries, especially the countries that are bordering the sea, which is very difficult to uh, defend and to have control of these uh, sea borders. And everyone should take its own uh, part of the burden, we think, and find the best solution. So I can just say this, only this. And, and about the uh, multi-annual financial framework, it, I think the discussion just started because the project has been uh, presented on the 5th of May, the first one. So there was only one general discussion uh, up to now. Uh, at the last general affairs council. It just started. Uh, <coughs> the different views are in a process of uh, formation. Uh, of course, everyone has it, uh, own, its own um, views and uh, considerations. For us, it's very important for Bulgaria, probably also for, the, for Ireland too, to keep um, certain parts of the policies uh, that uh, existed for several years or many years for, for some of the countries. For example, we are absolutely a proponent of the cohesion policy. And I think it will be our priority to, to keep uh, the cohesion policy and convergence policy because we think it's really uh, what it is about, the European Union. It is about having a stronger union, in incorporating each and every member state in it with um, the possibility to develop uh, further and better and to, to make it stronger also on the European and uh, in international scale. And after Brexit especially, we have to find also the right balance between uh, uh, countries that benefit uh, from the budget, from cohesion funds and countries that are net contributors. Uh, but I think there are certain policies that are really important for the welfare of our citizens and for, for the idea that we have to bring the European Union close to its citizens. So without these policies, it will be really difficult to do it. But of course, there is an important uh, issue added to that, and these are the new policies that we have uh, uh, agreed to uh, apply uh, as the next, as far as the next um, framework is concerned, so we have again to find the right balance between these uh, these two options, and uh, we cannot have. Uh, we we can have a better, of course, uh, restructured policy. We ha we can have uh, uh, better spending, and we can have also uh, find uh, better ways. Uh, for, in, for greater income to the mm -hmm. European Union. We still have to, to think that we, we pay only 1%, what it is now, 1% of our GDP, each and every country. So sometimes it is a bit exaggerated in certain mm -hmm. settings, but it's really very important to, um, to keep these policies. That's what I can add to this. Remark. And perhaps could I just follow mm -hmm. up uh, Jill's question on the budget by asking what is the Bulgarian view about this attempt to link future budgetary entitlement, structural funds and so on, to rule of law? Mm -hmm. This has arisen of course mm -hmm. because of what's happened in Poland and in Hungary. Mm -hmm. What is the Bulgarian perspective on this? Are you mm -hmm. in favor of establishing a linkage and how might that actually mm -hmm. work in the future? Yeah. Well, that's, that's another very important issue. Um, we think it is a, a rule of law is something that we cannot uh, debate. I mean, it's, it's an overarching principle of the European Union. We have to follow it with all possible means. But when we establish a link between these two, we should think also that there should be an institution or who will say finally, that the rule of law here and there is in breach. And it's, we have to be very careful 
in this. So for the moment, in this presidency, we try to be really very careful on pronouncing this and that on this issue because we have to see how the issue will, will develop in the several months. And um, as a country that we, we still has our mechanism for uh, cooperation and uh, monitoring, it is important for us to know what will be the criteria, and who will be the judge, mm -hmm. finally, to say what is happening here and there. And we, we know how difficult is the debate, for example, when we speak about um, Poland uh, reforms of the judicial system and this activation of Article 7. So we would like to have very careful and balanced approach on this issue. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Yeah. There are further questions? Yes, sir. I'm Horst Ischmann, member of the ECB. I will have uh, two questions. First is, is there any prospect that the Macedonian name issue will be resolved before the next EU summit? There were some rumors about progress. Second question, the role of Turkey. In the EU context, has it been discussed how to face a more assertive Turkey and as Bulgaria as a neighbor of Turkey, what is your impression of what the developments in Turkey? So, um, thank you for these uh, questions. They are really part of, in the heart of our uh, national foreign policy also, and they are really crucial for the region, for Southeast Europe, but also obviously they um, are very important and uh, give repercussions to the whole European Union policy. And sometimes, especially the issue of Turkey is really important for the general security in this part of the world. Um, I think before the end of the week, we will see um, what will happen with this issue with the uh, name issue, so-called name issue, the debate between our two neighbors, uh, because there will be a, another meeting in New York these days between the, the two foreign ministers, pro perhaps with the participation of the uh, UN messenger Matthew Nimitz. Um, so we are really in the days and hours of, uh, of these talks. There were also talks in Sofia between the two prime ministers during the summit meeting last week. Uh, they were talking even during the night, I understood. <laughs> I wasn't there, of course. But what we have heard was uh, really good news, uh, that they are very close to solution, uh, still having a road in front of them, <laughs> but close to solution, much more closer than ever happened before. So we will see. Uh, we, we are just uh, in a position of um, witnessing what is happening uh, in this issue and trying to be the best facilitator as possible uh, as a neighboring country, as a country with uh, history and um, certain legacy and uh, part of our national history is also connected to this issue. It is really very, very important to us what will uh, what, we, what we will get out of this uh, uh, finally. But the main thing is really the two countries to find the best um, name, the best solution of this name issue, which concerns also other things, uh, part of this. Uh, we would be um, a, a name valid for uh, each and every use, or uh, we will be just a kind of a national name and inside they will keep the Republic of Macedonia. We will see. I don't think it is a possibility at all, actually, for Greece to accept this uh, a solution which is not valid for uh, each and every usage. But still, we are in a process, and here we are also very carefully watching what is happening. And um, there was uh, recently a name that was uh, uh, mentioned by by the two sides, by the prime minister of uh, um, one of the country and the other was responding and all, the whole opposition was involved. Mm. So we see how difficult it might be. But finally, they might find the best, the best name for both of them. Uh, 
we will see. It is really directly linked to the progress on uh, the enlargement process. We know that it is a precondition to for the. The Commission has already, of course, uh, recommended uh, in its report that um, negotiations be open with uh, Albania and former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. But still, we expect to see how the countries, the member states, will react and what will be their conclusion at the end of June. And in the meantime, we need to have this uh, solution on, on this issue, of course. So I cannot prejudge, but we are in a good hands. Both, con both countries have the best negotiators now. Both foreign ministers seem very, um, very well prepared and very positive to find a solution. And I know from both of them that they, are really, they really want to have a solution. But mm -hmm. Of course, they have their own domestic political public, all these um, yeah. issues that might be involved. And about Turkey, uh, about Turkey, I would say that um, how do we see getting out of what is happening there? First of all, we have to see what will happen on the 24th of June. We expect to see the national elections in, in Turkey and um, how do they will develop and what, are the, what will be the results, which kind of government they will produce and the implementation of the constitutional changes that have been voted, I would say, democratically voted in Turkey uh, in the referendum. So we will see. I, I think it is important also with this country to have uh, also these uh, so-called channels of communications open and not to close the door just because it's an Islamic country or a uh, Muslim country, better said, not Islamic, but hopefully to stay just Muslim country, and um, we will see. Uh, it is important to keep, we think, Turkey in a negotiation track, although negotiations are frozen, uh, but um, what is the other perspective that we have? And what are the other means that we have hmm. to deal? And of course, we have also Turkey, not only this, but a key country to confront with this illegal migration coming in big waves to the whole European continent. One of the ways, of course, coming. They keep uh, 3,000 and a half millions of refugees, of migrants in their country. Imagine what could happen if they are not strong enough to keep them. So we are also working on this so-called threat mechanism of um, financing these uh, uh, refugees and uh, migrants in Turkey with uh, European Union uh, uh, budget. So that is what I can <laughs> say for now. May I just ask you a question mm -hmm. about the euro? Um, and it's a very simple one. Will Bulgaria join the eurozone in the near future. You mentioned ERM2, for mm -hmm. example, a little bit earlier. The LEV has been one of the most stable currencies uh, mm -hmm. in Europe for mm -hmm. the last mm -hmm. 20 years or so, a little bit less. Uh, the Bulgarian economy is doing very well, growing very strongly. So do you see a point in the near future where Bulgaria would join the mm -hmm. Eurozone? Well, we, of course, uh, we see we see a point that uh, we joined the euro. I cannot name a year or a moment exactly in time, uh, but I think we are determined to do it, determined to do whatever is needed to do it. And the reaction that we received was positive from Commissioner Moscovici, for example. He said, uh, yes, of course, Bulgaria is uh, eligible and um, uh, ready according to certain uh, benchmarks, but still it needs to do certain things to bring its budget probably uh, at GDP to a better, <laughs> better numbers, uh, and also to work a lot on other certain specific issues. But probably to join the ERM, we are we are ready to do it even now if yeah. the commission is, if the if the eurozone ministers decide so. Yeah. So I think we we are, will be there. It's part of our vision for the future of Europe. We should be in the core of uh, part of Europe because it is in our interest. I think it's also to the interest of all others to be there together. 
Yeah. So this is my position. Okay. Um, are there any further questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we may draw the session to a close. And just before we conclude, um, I'd like to thank the Minister uh, for that very comprehensive view of the Bulgarian presidency, Bulgaria's attitude to European integration, and to thank you also. Many of us in this room are very aware of the great support Bulgaria has offered Ireland on the Brexit negotiations, and that's very much appreciated. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much also to Ambassador Simon for the support that he has given the Institute in putting this event together. Thank you very, very much indeed. So we will conclude with uh, the appropriate uh, applause for the Minister. So thank you very much. Thank you.